Hey guys, so today we'll be talking about Samuel Coleridge, his Biographia Literaria, and his poem Christabel. I do have a couple learning objectives for you. This is something that you might use in the classroom. It's in kid-friendly language, and it's something that students can measure their learning by for the day. Number one, students will be able to describe Coleridge's ideas on the imagination. And number two, students will be able to identify supernatural themes in Christabel. I also wanted to go over kind of an agenda of what we're going to be looking at in what order. The first thing we're going to look at is um, the biogra Biographia Literaria. We're going to talk about um, the language of poetry and then Coleridge's ideas of imagination. Included on this topic, I have researched and found an article from the Journal of Anglican Studies that expounds on the ideas of Coleridge's thoughts about imagination, and then we'll move on to Christabel. I'm mainly focusing on part one of Christabel because it has the most examples of the supernatural in the poem. I'm going to start on page 302 in the textbook, and it's in the second paragraph. It says, Coleridge sharply denies Wordsworth's claim that there is no essential difference between the language of poetry and the language spoken by people in real life. So we learned that Wordsworth, one of his goals was to write in a common plain language that every man could understand. However, Coleridge disagrees that this can even happen because he talks about how a certain amount of prior knowledge is required for someone to understand poetry as well as things such as class factor into it. I'll touch on that a little later. On page 311, Coleridge argues that the good sense is the body of poetic genius. Fancy its drapery or clothing, motion, its life, and the imagination, the soul that is everywhere and in each, and forms all into one graceful and intelligent whole. So early on we see Coleridge's fixation on the imagination. He considers it to be the key or central part of poetry and how it comes about. On page 313, um, we see more about Coleridge's ideas on the language of poetry. Um, in the second paragraph, it says, Every man's language varies according to the extent of his knowledge, the activity of his faculties, and the depth or quickness of his feelings. Every man's language has first its individualities, secondly, the common properties of the class to which he belongs, and thirdly, words and phrases of universal use. So I did notice one commonality between Wordsworth and Coleridge because in the preface to Lyrical Ballads, um, Wordsworth talked about how a poet must think deeply and carefully about his poetry and Coleridge includes the depth or quickness of his feelings. So I do think that that's an aspect they agreed on. However, while Wordsworth focused on, let's say, universal language, Coleridge does list that as the third thing that attributes to language. First, it's individualities. Second, it's the common properties of language of the class to which someone belongs. So one would assume that someone in the higher class has more education and more capability to understand the sophisticated language than someone in a lower class. And then he thirdly lists the use of universal language. So now I want to move on to his ideas about the imagination. Um, if you would, turn with me to 306. So I'm looking at the excerpt from chapter 13. I just want to read his definition of the 
primary and secondary imagination, and then I'll go a little bit more in depth. The imagination, then, I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. The secondary I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of, a, of its agency and differing only in degree, and in mode of its operation. It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates, in order to recreate, or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events, it struggles to idealize and to unify. So those, those are his personal definitions of what he considers to be the primary and secondary imagination. Um, I think... A couple of key things to point out is that he points the primary imagination out as the living power, which to me suggests, in some context, religion. And then he says that the secondary imagine acts as an echo that coexists with conscious will. However, he points out that the difference is that it operates in a different mode from the primary. The Journal of Anglican Studies had some nice insight for Coleridge's ideas of the imagination. They said, Our dependence upon our imagination in this fundamental form is so great that Coleridge will liken its activity to God's creative act Insofar as we, through the work of imagination, have a world, a cosmos, and not simply random images multiplied into chaos. So I take this to mean that Coleridge maybe thought of the imagination as a way to process images, language, feeling, that sort of thing. Um, they say secondary imagination is the same unifying power. Coleridge's term is insimplastic but in a conscious, voluntary form. Its power dissolves, diffuses, and dissipates in order to recreate. It is the capacity to us to reimagine the world, to order its elements into a new whole. So I take that to mean that the primary imagination brings in the information, perceives it, whereas the secondary imagination comes in to reorder it, organize it, put it into a category, and kind of make sense of it. Coleridge's distinction between primary and secondary imagination is straightforward and simple. Contrasting the natural or innate logical scientific categories of our primary imagination with the poetic categories of our secondary imaginations, consciously drawn from reason and feeling. So I thought that this was interesting because we are coming from a time when of reason. So it's like the primary imagination brings in the information and the secondary imagination reasons and makes sense of it. So I thought that connected really nicely. Um, let's move on to Christabel. It is on page, let's see, I believe two, it is on, starts on page 277. I did want to point out something in the preface, that the preface to Christabel really reflects the emergence of concerns of plagiarism and ownership of written works during the Romantic period. However, it appears that this may be more of a preemptive attempt at self-defense on Coleridge's part. On page 253 in Coleridge's biographical introduction, we find out that the author was charged with plagiarism numerous times. So I thought that was interesting that he chose to introduce this poem in a way to anticipate the criticism that he might receive. Um, so I am on 277. I am going to read 
um, just the first stanza of part one to begin. It said, "'Tis the middle night by the castle clock, and the owls have awakened the crowing cock. To wit, to woo, and hark again the crowing cock, how drowsily it crew." So the opening couplet of Christabel immediately hints at the supernatural by the introduction of three things. Though they are commonplace in the everyday world, also they also have strong associations with the other worlds. So we have midnight, the owl, and the cock. Further, the howling dog, the crowing cock, the hooting owl all proceed toward an untoward event, and this feeling of uneasiness is increased by references to the shrunken form of the full moon and late spring. So it goes on, you can see that in the next two stanzas, it talks about the moon is behind and at the full, and yet she looks both small and dull. That is in the third stanza. And then in the second stanza is a reference to the mastiff that howls four, four for the quarters and 12 for the hour. Um, okay. And then in